Gamal Codner. Welcome to Built to Sell Radio. What's up, John? Not much, man. Take me back to Morocco. I hear you did an inspirational trip with your brother. Explain what happened. You know, I have this notebook of a bunch of cool ideas that I'm going to pursue entrepreneurially, and I do one at a time. So at the time, I was growing my beard out, and I kept using my wife's products to groom myself because for people who look like me, our hair, it's a long story. And so I was in Target and was buying pink bottles and got embarrassed when my gym buddy ran into me with a bunch of pink stuff in a basket. Fast forward a few months later, we're in Morocco, the shop at the local market, and we come across this oil that's been used apparently for hundreds of years. And that sparked the connection between, hey, maybe we can tie in what we used to use back in the day um, and create a modern day version of it. And so the idea for Fresh Heritage Grooming Products for African-American Men was born. Awesome. And so it's inspired by the way, in, in particular, your trip to North Africa, there were people using these oils that are now, they soften their beard before trimming it. Is that is that the idea? And you've yeah, expanded our, the product line also to hair, hair products and shampoos and, and different uh, products. Yeah. And so um, that's correct. So it started off as just a beard oil. And that was our sole product up until, I don't know, about like a half a million dollar a year kind of run rate. Uh, we did pretty well with just one product. And then based on our research, our customers wanted additional things. And so that is how we kind of got known as, hey, we have the best. And when we went to sell, that was actually one of our, our value props. We intentionally wanted to have more five star reviews than any competitor out there, rather large or small. So we just kind of built real deep and being known for doing one thing really well and then expanded the product lines out after that. How did the, the cash flow work? Uh, because the one thing about building a branded product is that can be quite capital intensive because you got to pay for the product. Uh, you got to run the marketing and then ship it out. And, and then you get, you know, like so sometimes it's a negative cash flow cycle. So just walk me through how the cash worked. Like explain that. If you yeah. Can. Cash flow sucks in e-com. And so um, if you're focused on growing too fast, it hurts because just like we said, um, you got to put in an order in product may arrive in two months. And you, so if you'd like to double, you probably have to pay double what you're currently can support. And then on top of that, it takes a while to get in. So you've got to really just buy three to four months of inventory. Yeah. So how did you guys You're do front in six months. So we essentially uh, started off with just credit cards. Uh, we raised a small friends and family round and um, uh, eventually got into a line of credit where we were able to just, you know, modestly forecast what we we're going to do and have the credit from the bank to be able to support the growth. So let me get this straight. So you, you, I'm assuming you contract, uh, manufacture the product based on your specs and ingredients. You had a, a friends and family line and then a, a round. So you had a little bit of capital, but then you had a bank line. So you commissioned the product to be uh, created, shipped to you. You had the line of credit to cover that and then sold it through your website was the primary distribution channel. Is that right? Correct. Correct. Or you're like digitally native direct to consumer brand. And that's how we started. But one, that was our, one of our biggest issues. I, I tell a story about how we always almost got bankrupt because we, we depended so heavily on Facebook ads as our, our marketing channel, our customer acquisition channel. And we lost our account right after I just put in our biggest order. And as I was buying that way, it was, uh, it was, it was horrible because all of our cash was tied up into this inventory that we couldn't move. And so I kind of restructured, and this is a time when we had, you know, a broadener product line. So I had a bunch of different products, um, fast moving and slow moving products. I ended up um, restructuring how we sourced and simplifying our items and our products down so we can get, you know, when we ordered, instead of ordering bigger orders fewer times a year, we ordered more frequently. So I needed less cash to kind of support the growth of the business. And so the purchase orders were smaller and they came from fewer people. So that helped us kind of be able to um, to grow and be more efficient with our capital. What caused Facebook to shut you off? Oh, man. Uh, so fortunately, it was, um, it was just a glitch and we got the account back, but it took longer than we expected. Um, and I probably lost three accounts on the process of growing this brand. It's just always like they change their terms. So we sold products to black men. In this particular case, we would say, hey, the best beard oil for black men and that became like a political thing, being able to call out people based on our race. And oh, so right. they flagged our account. And so they're always updating what their terms and conditions are. And it's hard to stay on top of it. So I've never been able to 
figure out Facebook advertising terribly well. Certainly, you sound like you mastered it. The The idea being you would identify, in this case, a demographic group with some unique characteristics and then run advertising against that group. The ads would get people to your website where there'd be an offer to buy and then you've got their name and then you can start marketing to them. Is that the basic business Correct. model? How Correct. much did it yeah. cost you in Facebook advertising to get a customer to your website? Yeah. And so... Fortunately, over the course of the entire brand, we hovered between a fifteen to eighteen dollars CPA customer acquisition cost, and so it hovered around that the entire time. Certainly, there were campaigns in in in, um, in the times where we got it much lower than that, like sub ten, eight, nine dollars. But that wasn't like sustainable. Those are just catching glitches and waves and of opportunities. So, just walk me through that seventeen, eighteen dollars. That's to run an ad on Facebook to get them to your website and buy something or just to get them to Correct. your website? Correct. Complete. So those are on purchases. Correct. Got it. So $15, $18 to get a person to buy. And what would the average yeah. basket be? Yeah. And so um, initially we only had one product. So it was right around 30 bucks. And so our initial uh, focus was just on growth and awareness because there weren't a lot of similar competitors. So we just kind of wanted to create more awareness. And then as we optimize later on, we got it up to around 55, 60 bucks in UV. Got it. And again, you captured email at the point of purchase. And so you could then remarket to them over time. Walk me through the VIP club because I, I saw it on your website and it looked like a, uh, a subscription offering of some sort. Can you just kind of walk me through that? Yes. So what I recognize also in that uh, kind of near bankruptcy thing where we lost Facebook and we had about two months of cash left, I needed to rebuild my business differently. And so I looked at all the things that we we're doing wrong and I had prior M&A experience. And so thinking about if I was an acquirer, if I was sourcing a deal, what are the red flags and what are the risks that I'd want to mitigate? And I identify them in my business. And a big one was we're too dependent on Facebook ads. Uh, and because of how much we depended on them, you just asked about cash flow, which is our second biggest problem is we couldn't really forecast supply chain. We would guess too much and have too much excess inventory. We wouldn't have enough and sell out and couldn't generate sales. And so a VIP club was like a solution to both. And so this was our membership program where we not only offered perks to our our clients to you know never run out of product and uh, get first to new releases, but also internally it helped us kind of manage cash flow better and uh, have more stable projections. And so whether or not our ads are, were performing or underperforming, we knew every single month we had consistent income coming in. And what was the value proposition of the subscription offering? Like what, what resonated that, with customers? Yeah, that's a good question. So a lot of people at the time were just offering like, you know, 10, 20% off. But what we recognize our value prop to our customers was we're building a, like internally, we're building a place for a growth oriented African-American man um, who wanted to improve their confidence. And externally, we did that through, you know, buying these grooming products, helping them look and feel better as they went out in life. And so for us, we knew that our guy, um, we actually like, talked to about four or 500 customers uh, during that time. And we realized that they didn't care about saving some money. It was more important to them, to them that they showed up as the alpha and like the dominant player in their world. And so instead of giving them a discount, which we obviously did, we more so made it about being a, a part of a membership because that resonated with them and other, other things that they paid for, where they were a part of an exclusive group of other men who were like them, who were also on this path of like upward trajectory. So we would have like quarterly meetups, where, you know, one guy just became a law partner, one guy just sold his business to Goldman. And we would just create these environments. Hmm. And so they just wanted to be around a community of other people like this. And we just happened to like monetize a relationship through Baird Oil. And so the VIP members were not just, hey, get your Baird Oil every single month, but it was get that as the, you know, the foundation. But here's these other perks that you get for being a part of us. And here's this other community of other men who share your values and have the similar ambitions as you that you may not be able to find anywhere else. What was the lifetime value of a typical VIP club member? Uh, it's it's difficult to say because um, we didn't start tracking that properly um, mm. until towards the end. And so when we went to exit, we saw our LTV of around, um, I think it was about six months. Uh, for the VIP members. But one of the things that were tricky about it is because they would still come back and buy products, even if they were not no longer in the club. 
So the actual track in the customer, we didn't have real data around that. They would probably buy a few times before, join the club, and then sporadically buy things uh, after they ended their VIP membership too. So it was hard to track. Yeah, and that's one of the, the hidden sort of secrets about a subscription offering that I've written about a little bit is that not only do you get the revenue from the subscription, which is great, but also they tend to buy more stuff. Like once they're a subscriber, they tend to buy additional products, more products, higher volume, et cetera. So there's kind of a two- That is it. Correct. Two benefits. Got it. Okay. Super helpful. Thank you for that explanation of the VIP club. So you've got revenue coming in from the website, Facebook driving people, you're converting them into VIP club members. Um, how big did you get this business before you decided you wanted to sell it? I mean, you could talk about number of customers or revenue or like whatever proxy you, you feel comfortable sharing. Yep. So VIP club got to over 3000 um, subscribers. Uh, our orders, we had over a hundred thousand customers and, um, we got it up to seven figures. I can't share the exact number, but I can, I can share that the company who acquired us has publicly shared that they like acquiring companies, uh, with 4 million or 4 million in annual revenue or more. So I can share that and you can kind of read between the lines to where we were. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes total sense. As you're building this, it sounds like you've had some M&A experience, you've got a pretty good sense of, of what is going to drive value for an acquirer. Had you any sense of what, what a kind of a, a, a business like yours might be worth? Uh, before or now? No, before, like as you're building it, like had you, did you guys start to get yeah, a sense of what um, you thought it might be I, worth? I did. And so um, I got into M&A um, because of um, a mentor of mine, raised um, about 320 mil from Goldman and he was building and selling companies. And I was helping him source deals and I kind of started a fundless sponsor um, company myself and raised 15 million to acquire companies that ended horribly well. I left, I was left like a quarter million in debt. Oh. I wanted to get on the operator side. And so, uh, Sorry, Jamal, originally, just for, for clarity, that ended badly. The, yeah, that yeah. ended badly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, I got, I got caught up with some transaction fees in an industry that, um, it was in the oil and gas sector and the price of the barrel of oil like dropped by from a hundred to 30 bucks over a weekend and Ugh. everything was a tailwind. So that spiraled out of control. But anyways, on the other side, um, my mentor, uh, built a e-com brand up to a hundred million dollars in a year and sold it to a $15 billion company. So I had a lot of insight about this idea of like building a digitally native brand. And I thought, you know, if you did it right, you can get a three to five X or four to six X multiple in on a relatively EBITDA. on EBITDA or SDE, depending on the size of your business. Sorry, what's that acronym? Um, S SDE, SDE seller's SDE discretionary seller's earnings. earnings. Okay. Like, Sorry, I just didn't hear yeah. the acronym. Yeah. yeah. Got it. And so I had a good idea. And so we kind of created this plan to uh, build a business and exit it within three to five years based on what we thought, you know, at that inflection point, we can get in a multiple. Got it. So you're thinking it's anywhere from, you know, it's probably in the sort of four to six times EBITDA. Is that, is that where your kind of heads at? Three, yeah. Four to five yeah. Times like it started off three to five, but um, around COVID and around the time we sold the multiples, kind of, you know, there's a bunch of capital that entered the market. And so the, the multiples kind of went up to that four to six range, depending on what you had. And so Got the it. things that we were doing by intentionally having like membership programs and um, and having things uh, like built in strategic value um, kind of allowed us to position ourselves to not only look at our numbers as being a sound brand, but looking at what strategic assets we've built that in the hand of someone else could be even worth more money. And so we were intentionally doing those things for like the prior two years to build that strategic value in addition to what our finances said. Got it. Yeah. So that's what I want to go to next. So, so you think it may be worth as much as four to six times EBITDA if we kind of play our cards right. So the, you're, you've got this mentor, the guy who built the $100 million company um, helping. So I've heard one thing you did was the membership program, 3,000 members. That's awesome. The other thing that I've also heard is the five-star reviews. I think you were you got up to 3,000 five-star reviews, which is Honestly, phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and and was that part of your goal in in building value? Is is it, you, that the the reviews were something that you can't just kind of flip a switch and build? Like it, it those are are hard to replicate. 
Yeah. So I'll, I'll share the strategic value we're thinking about building. And so, um, I knew from my friend who built this hundred million dollar business that, um, Procter and Gamble and a bunch of other like large consumer good products, they have this idea that, um, grooming products to black men, um, they, they typically are priced 11 bucks or less. Right. And so they're typically, um, retail and they go. And so if you understand the margin there, right, you build something for two, sell it to Walmart for four, they sell it for 10. Uh, what we were doing is cutting out that and keeping all the margin, creating a similar product for two, selling it direct to consumer for 25. Um, and so that was one thing, like figuring out how to sell at high volume to a customer base that they did not know how to do that. We thought that was our secret sauce. I, I listened a while back to an episode that I believe on this radio uh, where you we were talking about how um, Home Depot acquired a blinds.com. Blinds.com. Yeah. G Steinfeld. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And heard about that concept there of, hey, you know, it's not that Home Depot can buy your company and sell more blinds, but it's that you can teach Home Depot how to sell difficult things online. And I said, huh. And so that was kind of the, the thing that we really led with. And so we knew our ideal buyer would be someone who had a lot of focus in retail, who had not yet cracked the direct to consumer code hmm. and was in the, the, the volume game and not in the margin game. And so we thought we can share some of our best practices on how to build community and how to go after this kind of higher value target that they were currently having issues with. Awesome. And so that was the main like North star of what we wanted to push and all the other metrics just kind of supported this. Like, Oh, look, we had one guy that you can barely sell a $12 thing to. We've had him spend 1500 bucks on beard oil or he bought 46 times at this same high price product. And by the way, this is a much superior product to that because you know, I can say that, but quantifiably, how would you know? Oh, let's look at reviews, right? This has way more reviews than the leading product that Procter & Gamble sells. And so I wanted to create a story, but then have the quantifiable end of evidence to like support what we were building. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. I'll, I'll link up to Jay Steinfeld's episode as well in the show notes. Basically, for folks who don't know, we created Blinds.com and, and Home Depot bought them because number one, obviously, they want to be number one in the category. But number two, as Jamal, you're, you're referencing, it was because they wanted Jay's secret sauce on selling complicated products that needed to be installed online, which is what obviously most things are that you buy at Home Depot. So awesome. Okay. So drivers of value. So I've got number one, the membership program, the long you know, the long tail of that, the five-star reviews, 3,000 of those, the other direct-to-consumer code that you figured would be appealing to acquire. Anything else that you did to drive value of, of the business? Those are the main things. And Got it. like, we just understood that if we could just build community, that was the only thing we could out-compete on. We, we didn't have a big R&D staff. And so just having these really core high-value guys um, that were spending money and had huge lifetime value was huge. And the other thing that we did um, D to C uh, or the benefit of the membership program is that a lot of D to C brands um, depend on Facebook to grow. And so because we're in a niche audience, I recognize that probably our acquirers would not have the depth of understanding of our culture and our demographic. So I wanted to make customer acquisition and like that whole life cycle of um, how you generate funds from this audience, I'm um, systemized. And so I started to intentionally remove myself from the ads and the media buying, because I, ha I also have a media buying background. And so we started delegating our media buying and our custom acquisitions to not only agencies, but agencies that didn't look like us to really kind of not only say the story of, hey, anyone can do this, but also show the evidence. Hey, look, these agencies are, you know, they're diverse, or they're this or that, and they're still able to get the same or similar results. And so that was also intentional. Because sometimes it's like, you know, you, we do things as founders. I was doing things as, found, as a founder to like just grow the value. But for my time in m and I know just getting an offer is one thing, actually closing the deal is another thing. And so <laughs> having the support and the things to not only grow the value, but also quickly go through due diligence was more important to me because, you know, deals fail all the time. And from my prior experience, you'd be right at the finish line and some random thing comes up that we're not able to go through that either changes the terms drastically or just the deal doesn't go forward. And so it was very important to me to not only get an offer, but to sell my business. Love it. Love it. So let's go to that now. So you decide, you, you build it up, 3,000 subscribers to the VIP club, 100,000 customers. Um, what, what did you do next? Like, how did, did, how did, was there sort of some triggering event that said, okay, now's the time we want to sell? Yeah. Um, my wife got pregnant. And so, <laughs> Uh, she, I, I previously left my, my corporate job, had a six figure job to jump into entre entrepreneurship. 
and I'm a visionary, so I have all these ideas and shiny objects, but suck at really people managing and moving projects forward. I introduced my wife. Um, she is a project manager at, uh, you know, Fortune 500, managing like multinational, multi-million dollar um, projects and Opposites 140 attract. people. Right. Opposites <laughs> attract, right? And so it's classic like integrator visionary. And so I'm like, hey, I'm struggling with this and I'm doing a lot of things I don't know how to do well. Uh, my brother and I co-founded it, but you clearly have this strength. And so can you jump on? And so she took that over and then she was managing, you know, warehouse ops, hiring, firing people and all that supply chain. Where I could just focus on like relationship building, long term relationships, strategy, money and marketing. And so when she got pregnant and around the time that COVID happened, and it was you know kind of not safe for her to be pregnant and around a bunch of people. Sure. We were like, all right, it's time to think about what the next phase of our life is going to be like. So that was the triggering event. Interesting. Interesting. It's not the first time I've heard that a triggering event is a baby on the way, actually. It's funny that that is probably a, we could do some research on that at some point. So walk me through, what was your next step? Once you decide, okay, now I want to sell, did you proactively market the business? What, what, what did you do next? Yeah, we started interviewing brokers because uh, we, like I was, like I was already running the whole business myself with my, my wife not being able to support it. And so I didn't want another job of like trying to go out and find buyers and so we, we shopped around for some brokers and we, um, we settled on Quiet Light. They do an amazing job and, uh, interviewed a couple of brokers and went with Quiet Light. And then we kind of just spent the next, I believe, 30 to 45 days just getting everything together and transferring like our data room into a format that they could, um, also get all the things that they need and just prepare for going to market. And what was the reaction to the market? Crazy. Um, so I knew we were doing things well. And by the way, we also had a 40% um, like EBITDA margin. So quite unusual for e-com um, is about twice the industry standard. Hmm. Um, but all the things we've already talked about kind of made it appeal, you know, cutting that, going direct to consumer, having repeat revenue, keeping our customer acquisition costs low, so on and so forth, focusing on long, long lifetime value. So we went to market uh, within the first 10 days. We had over 200 offers to um, to request more information to get on a call with us. So 200 wow. interested buyers. Nuts. Wow. Wow. How did you filter those down? It's a good thing we had quiet light to be able to do that. And so we came up. This is wild, too, by the way. We came up with a list of 10 potential buyers, not like specifically like this person or that person, but just um, based on like customer persona. Right. And so if you're running ads, it may be, you know, this guy with this age, this income, we created a similar thing for what we thought our ideal buyer would be. So someone heavily in retail or Amazon or these things, right? Someone has an existing grooming business, that kind of thing. And so we shared that and someone who wanted to keep our focus on our customer base and not uh, diversify into another, like go broad stream. And so we created this list of things with the buy with the broker and we kind of filtered them down on people who actually had the money, people who were serious, had prior M&A experience because I just didn't want to waste my time after close the deal and people who had these kind of shared values. And so we started having the conversations after that. So we got down to like, you know, two dozen people. OK, OK. And, and did you solicit letters of intent? Like how many formal letters of intent did you receive from that? We department? had about a dozen. OK. And, and so what was your reaction to the, the letters of intent? I mean, like what was this happened so fast? So we went from market to under LOI in 28 days and from under LOI to um, deal close money and account in under 28 days. Wow. So it happened really fast. That's incredible. So how did you choose the, 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 the company to go under LOI? Like what was it about their offer that that was attractive? Yeah, believe it or not, um, on this one page sheet that we had, um, I'm not going to say the potential acquirer's name, but on my my one page business plan, when we started the business, I said, I wanted to sell in three to five years to this buyer. Right. Um, and so put that on pause. And then we were interviewing like these dozen people who were su super interested. And one of them had their M&A team and they're like, hey, you know, we just left the M&A shop from this company. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. And I shared it with them. I'm like, look at my one page business plan. I literally wanted to get acquired by this team. And technically, even though it's not the same company, the team from that company is over here running and operating this new business. And so we got acquired by an aggregator that 
kind of recruited the best from like L'Oreal, Gillette, Procter & Gamble. And they had a lot of industry expertise in personal care and grooming. And so the company we originally wanted to get acquired by, that team came over here. And so it was like, it was like the stars aligned and God saying, I got you. Like, this is what you wanted and here it is. And so it just made perfect sense. They had all the industry experience and prior experience running that ideal uh, brand. And so we had that same company here. And so it was amazing. You mentioned the the uh, acquirer was an aggregator. Uh, I believe that the, the acquirer's name is Branded. Is that Branded, correct? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And when you say an aggregator, what do you? They're 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 buying up uh, uh, direct consumer digitally native brands and and aggregating them together and taking advantage of sort of efficiencies. Is that the model? Yep, kind of that one plus one equals three thing, yeah. where they you know they own several personal care grooming brands and kind of share back office support, warehouse and logistics, all that kind of thing to squeeze out additional margins. So that's exactly it. So they, they bought about 40 brands and they were doing like multiple nine figures in annual re, uh, revenue. Got and it. so we're a good fit to like tuck into an existing personal care um, vertical and a couple of brands that they had in personal care and grooming. As you're building the business, you thought, you know, three to five times EBITDA, as COVID happened, multiple started to go up, four to six may be possible. As you looked at those 10 or so offers that you got, 12 offers, like what was the range in multiple? Like what what were kind of low to high? Um, yeah, so they're all kind of in that in that range because, you know, the broker would kind of field deals that were a waste of time. Um, so they're all kind of in that range that you would expect around that time for e-com brand. Uh, the thing that really separated the deals were um, how involved we needed to be post-close and how much of that was cash up front um, versus like a longer earnout, or how much of the, what percentage of the business they were buying. So we wanted to optimize for more cash at close with less involvement since we had this new family member. And yeah. the reason for sale and that was not that, not only that it's kind of, hit a path where, you know, we needed some more support because we had a lot of demand internationally and uh, we were at the point where we needed to get into retail and we didn't have that prior experience. And so that was a perfect inflection point for us to bring on an acquirer because those are exactly the things that we were preparing our business to be attractive, attractive to. And then we didn't have that experience. And so it made like a perfect story to, hey, we got it to this point. Here's all this data and demand to go into retail. This is your experience. It's a perfect marriage. Um, so it's tremendous upside. And so we also now have this family. So we wanted to optimize a deal where we didn't have to continue working or we didn't have to reinvest our, our, a lot of our assets are tied up in this one entity. A lot of our income and, and wealth is tied up in this one asset. And so we wanted a scenario where we could take back as much of that as possible and turn it over to someone who had a lot of competency and experience going globally and in retail. And, and how did they structure the deal? Like proportion of. Cash versus earnout. Anything you can share there? I can't share those specific details, but what I can say is um, it's a combination of both cash and upside, um, which is typical for like these kind of like strategic deals, because um, you know they're they know what they're doing, and so you want to be able to still get a second bite of the apple. So we took a um, we sold majority of the company, got majority cash at close, and also had some upside potential as the company continues to grow and do well. And the upside uh, is specific to Fresh Heritage's growth, i.e. like an earnout, or is it the upside tied to branded all of the company? Yep. So our specific deal was just the brand because um, um, I had an option with them and with others to um, take my expert expertise and experience and roll it into the bigger company, which would you know allow me an opportunity to produce, participate in the upside of the entire entity. But just because we just had the baby and we wanted to really spend some time uh, back with our family, we decided to not uh, go with an offer that was structured more like that. Got it. And did you give Branded the Acquire rights to use your name and likeness in telling the story of Fresh Heritage? Like, was that part of the deal? I did. And so um, part of part of it was like finding this balance of, because I wanted to do that because that, you know, that, that can offer ongoing, ongoing compensation and, um, which is great. And so you, I wanted to kind of find this balance of, Hey, um, this, this name, image and likeness agreement, in addition to the asset sale agreement makes a lot of sense. And here's the value of it. 
but not too much so where it's like, oh, no, you're too tied to the business and we need you to continue on as an employee or have an earn out structure tied to the performance of the company. And so I was trying to find this delicate balance. And so I found a balance where systems were in place enough for it to live without me. But the things that I needed to stay around was for more like community building and understanding like strategic connections with the community and like strategic growth, but not day-to-day operations. And because our founder story was a big part of it, a separate name image likeness agreement um, was negotiated. Got it. And that name and likeness, is that in perpetuity of the, for the life of the brand or does it have a sort of a time limit? Yeah, it has a time limit. Got it. Got it. That's super helpful. You up for a quick uh, lightning round of questions before I let you go? Sure. Let's do it. What was the dirtiest trick one of those acquirers tried to play on you? You talked to a couple hundred folks. I'm guessing there was a dirty trick in there too. You know, um, I don't have one because our broker did a good job of fielding it. All the all the things we got were pretty above board, thankfully. Ooh. What was the low point for you emotionally during the sale of your company? Oh, it almost died. Um, and it almost died. I remember they they brought on a, a new attorney that had, you know, we're in skincare and ingestibles. We had supplements. And so they brought on a new attorney with like super FDA um, um, like experience. And she wanted to halt the deal because of a very simple thing is, you know, as entrepreneurs are like, I came up with like five different ways to like solve this thing. And she's like, oh, no, it needs to be the sixth way. And we could not get it past it. And I was I was for sure certain that the deal was going to die. And fortunately, we got past it. Good for you. Uh, so that was a low point. What was the high point? Um, the high point was really the first day went to market. And then we just saw all this interest. We, it's amazing. You know, as founders, as founders, you don't know like what. If anyone really thinks this thing is valuable, you, brokers are telling you that it's valuable and you've put all this work in, but you don't really know. And then to see all the support from day one and to see the caliber of people who are interested in acquiring us, it was really just like an emotional kind of tear-filled day for us. I bet. I bet. It's certainly validating that you had something of value for sure. Talk to me about how you educated yourself about the process of selling a company. You worked in M&A, so you had firsthand experience. You have this mentor that had firsthand experience. W- were there any other resources you turned to? I'm thinking of like a book you could point people to or a course or a, a conference or anything you can point folks to that would be helpful. Yeah, that's the thing. Um, uh, so your book, amazing. Your podcast, amazing. I was, I was sharing with Colin that, you know, I had this prior experience, but my wife didn't. And we were partners and we we're going through this together. And so I, we found your podcast and she would listen to this to kind of understand what made sense. Cause when I'd be like, Hey, you know, we can't let this person go because they have seniority. And so even though they're underperforming, we just got to invest in coaching them because it just looks better. Right. And all these objections. And she's like, that doesn't make any sense. And so we'd listen to this podcast and learn. So. Definitely, you're you're a podcast. Oh, that's very generous. Thank you. And then specifically for e-commerce, um, after we sold, a lot of people have been hitting us up and saying, "Hey, we we'd like to get an investor or build our business." And so we now start coaching e-commerce founders, specifically e-com founders, on how to build valuation before you know like the one to two years, how to put the things in place to like help you prep for an eventual exit. That's awesome. And and we'll put your LinkedIn profile. I'm assuming the, that's the, the best place for f- folks to reach out to you in uh, in the show notes. Do you, do you also have like Instagram and Twitter? Like what, what other handles do you have that we should know? Yeah. About? So Instagram uh, is our website, codner.co. And um, my Instagram, Gamal Codner, is the same actual handle as on Twitter. But I'm more active on Instagram. I'm just Great. getting started on Twitter. So LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter are the best places. All right. And we'll put all those in the show notes at builtthecell.com. Before I let you go, I got to ask you, did you buy yourself a trophy to commemorate this win? You know, that's the weirdest thing. Uh, that same mentor said, I want, he challenged me to not buy anything for six months. And so I had my eyes set on a, a yellow gold Rolex date just, or sorry, a day date. And I, we went and looked at it and Rolex was like on back order at the time. And so that kind of helped too. And then after six months, I realized I didn't even want it. And so the only thing we really did was we got a full time nanny. Uh, so we, we, prior we relocated to a condo on the beach in, um, South Florida and we're working and didn't really have enough time to like really enjoy it. And so we're living in paradise. 
And so we said, you know what? A much better use of this money is to get a full time nanny. Hey, to, man. You know, help our daughter take care of her. And we just like enjoyed ourselves for six months. So that was hey, what we did. I'm I'm a huge uh, believer in <laughs> help where help is needed. I love having a <laughs> full time nanny. That's awesome. <laughs> well, congratulations. Congratulations on the sale. I think it's an amazing story. I have a feeling we're going to have to do another version of this with your next e commerce business because I'm sure there's going to be more. Let's do it, John. Down the street. That would be sweet. Um, Cool. So, Gamal, we'll put all of your links uh, to Instagram, to your website, LinkedIn, uh, uh, builttosell.com. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me.